Well, go ahead and grab your Bible if you have one with you today. Of course, you can also follow along as usual on your Bible.com Bible app under the events section of that app. Um, now's a good time also to hashtag check in for charity for us on Facebook if you haven't done that already. Uh, it is a new, or it's the first Sunday of the new month, and so we are uh, bringing awareness to a new charity, and we're donating to a new local charity a month, and this month is actually a brand new charity that we're very excited about, and I'm really, really excited about this local charity because uh, it's a brand new 501c3 started by our very church, so uh, Grassroots Marriages is what we're um, donating to today, and the vision of Grassroots Marriages is to help marriages before they hurt, so we challenge couples to uh, be better before they're in a crisis. And so we'll talk a little bit more about grassroots marriages later on in the service and later on this month. We're just trying to highlight it this month. Uh, but, and we'll give you even later in the, in the service and later on for the next four weeks uh, a special opportunity to actually uh, give a special offering to grassroots marriages to help get off the ground. So hold on to your wallets. Uh, but later on, we'll get a chance to get them out and use them if you'd like. Um, so the, the point is of grassroots marriages is that in my line of work, I see a lot of people whose marriages get to the point where they feel like it's too late. And then they go through a very painful and hurtful divorce that nobody ever wants and nobody ever thought that they would have to experience. And, and we want to save people from that incredible pain and that struggle of going through those really difficult times. And so we want to save marriages before it's too late. And so this is a very unique charity uh, in the way that we challenge couples to do that and we incentivize couples to get help before their marriage is in crisis. Uh, but, um, so go ahead and go online, look for it, like the Facebook page, all that stuff, uh, give your donation, and help support this awesome ministry that we are starting. So, and of course, also just look around you today, and if anybody's lost and people are like, what is this hashtag check for charity stuff, or what is this Bible app thing, or, or what's a Bible, then you can help them out, you can uh, share with them your Bible, you can help them to figure out the app or anything like that today. So be a good neighbor, that's important to our church, so we bless our neighbors, so I encourage you to do that today. Uh, we are starting a brand new four-week message series today called I Choose. I Choose because we face many different choices in life. In fact, life is the sum of our choices that we make. The decisions that we make today are the life that we live tomorrow. So the choices you make matter. And I, I, want, to, um, I want to highlight in on how to make wise choices through this series. Oftentimes when we face with really important choices, we make the mistake of not knowing how to make the best choice. And instead of us making the best choice, we defer to other people to make the cho choice for us. So we go with what's popular. We look for popularity instead of what's purposeful. So we don't really make the choice ourselves. We wait for other another group of people to make the choice for us, and we just do what's kind of popular among that group of people. And, and if we choose to do what's, pop what's just popular, the masses may be wrong, right? I mean, that's what our mama used to always teach us. If everybody else jumped off the bridge, would you jump off the bridge too, right? And you say, yes, because it's the popular thing to do, because that's all you care about at that age, right? And so today we want to help you to choose purpose over popularity. Purpose over popularity. Today I choose purpose over popularity. Your purpose in life is not just to be like who everyone else already is, right? If we were created to be just like them, then we would not be us, we would be them. But we're not them, we're us, right? And so you are different than everyone else. You are created uniquely by God. You have your own brain, you have your own life, you have your own unique mission and purpose in life. Now what is your purpose? And what is my purpose? And how do I know what my purpose in life is? Well, how, how do you find out any purpose of anything, right? How do you figure that out? One option, one option when you try to figure out the purpose of something is to ask someone else, hey, how does this thing work? What is the purpose of this thing? How, how is this used? And, and maybe they can help you figure out the purpose of the thing when you ask somebody else what that purpose is. Maybe you can ask for popular opinion and you can actually figure out what the purpose is for your life. Maybe that will work. But other times, popular opinion may not work for that. It may not be helpful in determining the purpose of your life. Popular opinion isn't the most reliable source of information in determining the purpose of what choices you should make in life. So, for example, my wife and I, and my family and I, like to play this game called uh, Telestrations. Has anybody played this game, Telestrations, before? Yes, of course, Lady has. Uh, telestrations is kind of like 
a uh, cross between that old game of telephone. You know that game of telephone where you used to whisper something in someone's ear and they turn and whisper that same thing in someone else's ear and all the way down the line until you just all laugh at how the story of the message came at the end of the line. And it's a cross between that and maybe like illustrations, like Pictionary, where you draw a picture and you try to interpret the picture. And then the next person looks at your interpretation of the picture and they draw a new picture. And then the next person interprets that picture all the way down the line until you know you laugh at how distorted your perception of the picture turned out. And the drawing that will forever live in infamy for us, it's really fun, it's a funny game for us, but when we were playing as a family, the drawing that forever will live in infamy was drawn by my son Levi, who passed his drawing to me to interpret the drawing. And I'm staring at the drawing that my eight-year-old son has made, and he's normally a very good artist, right? Rodeo art winner, all that stuff, right in school. But not really the case in this particular drawing. You know, I was really struggling to figure out what is he trying to get me to, to write. And I stared at it, stared at it. I could not figure out anything. I had no clue what I was supposed to be interpreting. So best I could do, I, I wrote what it looked like. I said, a cowboy throwing a loser at the sun. <laughs> And obviously, that is not anything that would be written on any kind of Pictionary card. Um, and so at the end of the game, at the end of the round, Levi reveals what this drawing was supposed to be. And he says, this was a picture of bird watching. I said, oh, yes, it makes total sense now. Now I can see bird watching. Once I had asked the creator of the drawing what it was, then that was the only thing I could see now in that drawing anymore was bird watching. It was perfectly clear because when we ask, if you want to know the, the purpose of a thing, we ask the creator of the thing. Purpose is defined by the designer, not by the observer, right? Purpose is defined by the designer. If you want to know your purpose in life, the best way to find out your purpose is to not ask other people, not look for popular opinion about what they think about you, but is to ask your designer, your creator. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, ask the creator of the thing. Purpose is defined by the designer. Our purpose is to be who God designed us to be, not who everybody else thinks we should be. You are not, listen, you are not a cowboy throwing a lizard at the sun, okay? <laughs> you are a bird watcher. Listen to what God tells you. Purpose is defined by your designer. God helps us to make the right choices in life in the same way. The choices that may or may not be popular in life, but they will lead to a life of purpose. Maybe not a life of popularity, but a life of purpose when we ask our designer. Your purpose is to be who God designed you to be, not what makes you popular. So we have to kind of stop focusing on what other people think. Stop focusing on what will make us popular. And focus instead on what God created and designed each of us to be in life. So we have to stop making choices based upon what everyone else is doing. And start instead choosing to do what God tells us to do. Choose to live your life for the purpose of it was created. Choose to live your life according to the creator who created you to live. So today we have to decide I will choose what I was made to do over just what other people are doing. I will choose purpose over popularity. And what happens when you do that? What happens when you start to choose purpose over popularity in life? Well, three things happen. Three results of choosing purpose over popularity. And the first result of choosing purpose over popularity is this. Purpose diminishes distraction in life. Purpose diminishes distraction. Our desire for popularity can distract us from mission and from our purpose in life. The thing that distracts us most from our purpose is other people's purposes and getting distracted by them. From living a life that we are meant to live, we start looking at the lives that other people are meant to live and what they're called to do. And we get distracted. So, and as Andy Stanley says, you know, there's no win in comparison. There's no win in comparison. We, when we constantly compare ourselves to the lives of other people, when we contrast our lives to them, that doesn't make life better for us. It makes life more full of envy. It makes life more full of pride. It just makes life worse for us when we constantly compare ourselves to others. So we have to stop being distracted from living other people's lives and start focusing on the life God called us to live. Uh, I like uh, to watch Steph Curry in the NBA on the Golden State Warriors. He's the two-time reigning NBA MVP, uh, and he's the first ever MVP uh, in the National Basketball Association that was unanimously selected as MVP. So the guy's a pretty good player, right? And the interesting thing about this two-time MVP is that 
this two-time MVP is not the highest paid player in the National Basketball Association. He's not even close. There are 81 other basketball players in the NBA that are paid more than the two-time reigning MVP. And to make matters even worse, Steph Curry is not even the highest paid player on his own team. He is the fourth highest paid. There are three other players on his own team that are paid more than Steph Curry. But he doesn't compare his life to other people, and so it doesn't matter to him. It doesn't bother him. He knows his purpose. He said, he's used quoters saying, one thing my pops always told me is you never count another man's money. It's what you've got and how you take care of it. Curry's dad didn't want him to get distracted by other people and their purpose and their callings and what they were doing. Curry's dad didn't count, told him not to count other people's money. And I think our dad, our father, tells us not to count other people's money as well. Don't let yourself be distracted by popularity but by or by what other people think or what, how other people think that you're valuable. You are made valuable by your purpose that God created you for. When we know our purpose, we are no longer consumed by what other people think of us, what other people are doing. It just doesn't matter because we know what God's called us to do. Purpose is diminishes distraction. So if there's somebody in your life that you're constantly comparing yourself to, stop following on, on Instagram, right? Stop comparing your everyday to their highlight reel. Just stop putting yourself in a place of constant envy for, to them. Uh, stop following them. In the Bible, there's a man named uh, Nehemiah who was in charge of rebuilding the wall around uh, Jerusalem. And he was a man of singular purpose and singular vision. He knew exactly what God was calling him to do. It was specific. He was going to build, rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Now, that doesn't sound like that great of a purpose, right? To build a wall. If God called you to build a wall, you'd, be, you'd probably be a little bit disappointed with that calling in life. But Nehemiah understood what his calling was, and he was empowered by it. And he wasn't distracted from that purpose either. And so in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 2, these people were trying to distract him from his calling to pull him away from the job that he felt called to do. And he says to those distractions in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 2, I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending a message to them, I'm, I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't come. And very simple, right? I'm engaged in the great work, so I can't come. I'm doing great work. I don't have time for your distractions. I'm accomplishing God's purpose for me. So it may, it may not seem like that much to you. It may not seem like it's that important to me, to you, but it's important to me because it's important to God. I'm doing great work. I'm by fulfilling my purpose. I don't have time for your distractions. <coughs> Living for the approval of others distracts us from the purposes of God. So purpose diminishes that distraction. Choosing purpose over popularity diminishes distraction. The second result of choosing purpose over popularity is that purpose empowers you to please God. Purpose empowers you to please God. So imagine with me, just you know, pretend, imagine a world where everyone, everyone likes you. You please everyone all the time. Everyone approves of every move you make, every decision you've ever made. Everyone admires you, and they think that you're awesome. You don't have any haters. Can you imagine that world? Me neither, right? <laughs> this is impossible. This is an impossible world that will never happen, right? Because you can't please everybody. Now, imagine with me a different world. Imagine with me a world where not everyone is pleased with you, where some people just plain don't like you, and you have no idea why. But imagine this. You don't care. Imagine that you don't care. Because you care more about pleasing God than you care about pleasing other people. Can you imagine that world? That's doable. That's possible for you. Because you can't please everyone, but you can please God. Right? You can't please everyone, but you can please God. Purpose empowers you to do that. Purpose empowers you to please God. And, and think about it. I mean... Being popular does not, not mean that you're better than someone else. It just means that you might be better at pleasing people than someone else. It, it, all popularity means is that you're good at pleasing others, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're accomplishing your purpose in the world or that you're pleasing God at all. You're probably not pleasing God because you're probably more focused on pleasing others than pleasing God. And, and your purpose gets rid of that distraction, and it helps you, it empowers you to actually please God. 
So why in the world, if you think about it, why in the world would we care more about what strangers think than what our Savior thinks of us? Why would we care about more about what the, what the bully says about us at school versus what you know, our Heavenly Father, our creator of our very being, says about us? Well, why would we care more about what the crowds say about us than what Christ says about us? Why would we care more about what our stupid boss says about us than what we care about our ultimate boss, our ultimate Lord and leader of our lives, Jesus says about us? It doesn't make any sense that we would elevate these opinions of other people over the opinions, the opinions of God. There's a story uh, of the apostles in the early church found in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5 in the Bible. And in that story, the apostles went against the will, the, the popular will of the religious authorities. They went against the will of all of this popular opinion, and they preached the name of Jesus instead. Even though that they knew that it was not popular, even though they knew it was not even not popular, it was going to get them in trouble. It was going to get them put into to jail, and that's what happened. They got put in jail because of their preaching. And then somehow, miraculously, the story says that an angel came and, and broke them out of, of jail. And so now they're released from jail. And now what do you expect them to do? Do they this time say, well, it ended, we ended up in jail last time, so now we're, we're going to stop preaching the name of Jesus? Or are they going to continue to preach the name of Jesus, continue to listen to their ultimate authority rather than the authority of others? And so let's pick up that story in Acts chapter 5, verse 25. Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people. The captain with his temple guards uh, went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles again, but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. See, everybody has this problem of caring too much about what other people think of them, right? They were afraid the authorities cared too much about pleasing the crowds too. Verse 27. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name, he said. Instead, you have filled all Jerusalem with the teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised, uh, God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as the prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. So it's so obvious to the apostles, when given the choice between pleasing the crowds and pleasing their creator, they choose to please God. They, given the choice between obeying what everyone else has, has to say, I mean, who everyone else looks up to as the religious authority, they stay, say instead, we must obey God, who is our ultimate human, our ultimate authority. Because they have a purpose. They know their purpose. Their purpose, it, it, Jesus tells them their purpose. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Purpose empowers you to please God to their, that very end. Obedience to Christ it is, is not obedience to the crowds. Pleasing, be, uh, obedience to Christ is what is pleasing to God. We, we please God through our obedience to him. That's our purpose. That's our mission. Jesus says, teach them to obey all the commands I've given them. So we might say that we love God. Sometimes we might sing songs about loving God, and that's fine. But if we really, really love God, then we will obey His commands. Obey His commands, even when they're unpopular. We have to obey His commands, even when it makes us unpopular when we obey them. If you love God, then obey His commands, even when the rest of the country, the rest of the world tells you that you're a simpleton or a bigot or hateful or intolerant or whatever words they want to use, because you can't please everybody. And please God. And pleasing God comes through obedience to Him. It's evidence of our love for Him. So, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, John says this. He says, Loving God means keeping His commands. He's keeping His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Now, you know what's burdensome? I know what's burdensome for me. Burdensome for me is, is trying to constantly please other people. That's burdensome. But obeying God, 
That's not burdensome. God's commands are not designed to make life burdensome, to make life difficult for us. No, God is he's giving us commands to give us life. God is not a cosmic killjoy. No, he is the creator of joy. His commands are his calling for you. His purpose for you is to have a better life than the life that you try to choose on your own. Live life trying to please God, and then your life will be more pleasing to you. That's just the way it works. When we live to please God, our life becomes more pleasing to us because God's commandments are not burdensome to us. Whatever God's specific purpose is for your life, I'm not really sure. You'll have to sort that out between you and God. But whatever God's specific purpose is for your life, we do know his general purpose for your life. And his general purpose is found in John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus says the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose, Jesus says, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. An abundant life. Life to the full, some translations say. Purpose empowers you to please God. And a pleasing and pleasing God gives you a pleasing life. Now, a pleasing life, a satisfying life, that doesn't mean an easy life. It doesn't mean you'll have no difficulty. It doesn't mean you'll have no pain. But it means that whatever you go through will be worth it. It will be worth it in the end. Because the third result of choosing purpose over popularity is that purpose pushes you through the pain. It pushes you through the pain. Life lived according to God's purposes, living life God's ways, it doesn't mean that you'll always live a life completely void of pain. It doesn't mean that everything will be perfect. Hell, that didn't happen for any God-fearers in the Bible when you read their stories. Not even for Jesus Christ himself. Jesus suffered injustice and torture and the most horrific form of execution of his day, which was crucifixion. Now you'd think, of course, that God in the flesh, that Jesus would have just managed to avoid all pain in life. He would have lived the right way and that therefore he would have never had any pain in life. And that's just not what happened. In fact, Jesus, people thought that that's what Jesus should do. And, and even to the point of death, he was challenged by the people that stood at the foot of the cross yelling out to Jesus as he was dying on the cross. He was like, if you're really the son of God, then just come off the cross. Stop going through all this pain. You don't need to. Just avoid it. But Jesus didn't come down. He didn't avoid the pain. Instead, he pushed through that pain to the bitter end because he was on a mission. Because he had a purpose. Jesus had a purpose. And because he had a purpose, he was able to push through that pain. And that purpose that kept Jesus on the cross, that purpose that kept him there, was us. We were his purpose. We are his purpose. That the purpose that drove Jesus to the cross and kept him up there to die for us was us. He wanted to take all the punishment that the sins of all the world deserve, your sins. He wanted to take those that punishment away from you. His purpose was to take the pain that he knew that you would experience. He wants you to have a better life. His purpose on the cross was your salvation, your rescue, your life. God wants you to live real life, an abundant life, a full life, a rich and satisfying life. But you'll never find that life if you're only going to do what's popular instead of living by your purpose. The kind of life God wants us to experience is, is a life where we choose to let God be our purpose in everything. When we choose Jesus as our Lord, when we choose to let Christ save us. It doesn't mean our lives are going to be free of pain all the time, just like Jesus wasn't free of pain. But when you choose to live life with Christ as your purpose, you will experience this real and satisfying life. A peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And you have that opportunity to do that, to do that today. Whatever pain you might be going through. Whatever you're experiencing today, you can choose to invite Christ into that pain with you. Choose to invite Christ to, to help you to push through that time of pain. Trust him in the midst of it. Trust that he has a greater purpose, that he has a desire to redeem whatever pain that you're going through for something good. Choose to let Christ redeem that suffering for you. Choose to let God bring a, a purpose to your pain. Choose to let God give you the real life that you were created to live. 
And today to do that, I want to invite you to, to just pray a prayer with me and to let God be the choice that you make for your life. It's only a choice that you can make for yourself. No one else can make it for you. So if you've never done that, if you've never chosen Christ to be your Savior, if you've never chosen God to be the purpose of your life, and I want to give you that opportunity today, just pray with me in the quiet of your heart. We just bow our heads together. Whether or not we're praying this prayer, we can bow our heads in a, in a spirit of prayer, encouraging uh, those around us that may have not made that choice to make that today. So let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, I'm so sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for choosing a life that has been separated from you. Please forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for trading your life for mine. Thank you for taking the punishment my sins deserve. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for loving me. Today, I choose you, Lord Jesus. I choose to receive your salvation. Today, I choose to give you my life as my Lord, as my leader, as my purpose. So please fill me with your spirit as I choose to live every day of my life from now to eternity with you. For the rest of us here today, God, who maybe have chosen to follow you with our life before, may we choose afresh today. May we choose to, in a fresh way, to, to follow you, to give you control of our lives. Help us to continue to choose, choose you each and every day with every decision that we make. Fill us with your spirit each and every choice. And God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come and join us in this place. We pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this bread and juice that we're about to receive in the Lord's Supper, that you'd make it be for us like your body and your blood, so that as we eat it, we'll be filled with your Spirit, so we will receive a closeness to you through this meal. And empower us, God, as we leave this place today. To live a life for you. Because we know that by pleasing you, we will live a pleasing life. The life Jesus says of a rich and satisfying life. An abundant life. Holy Spirit come in Jesus' name. Amen.